Maybe this is the end of Mid Journey hoarding the best models like some kind of Smaug dragon figure. Check this out. These are six images. Three of them generated using Mid Journey, three of them generated using an open source model trained with offset noise. They have a word for this, and that word is parity. Excitement aside, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about what offset noise is, we're gonna explain the concepts behind it, um, and then at the end we're gonna compare some models trained with offset noise versus like all the models and demonstrate that like, yes, it's good. And before I go on, I have to mention Kako, who was the person who trained the model that got these good results. Again, I'm not gonna tell you which is which, that's a little tasty treat for for, for getting you to stick around for attention. Okay, but let's talk about the technicals. Offset noise uh, was discovered publicly for the first time by a guy called Nicholas Gutenberg. And what they did is they were generating a bunch of images with stable diffusion, and they noticed that if you averaged the pixel value, so you took the red, the green, the blue channels, and you averaged all their pixel values, and you scaled them to between one and zero, Right, so like a pure white pixel is one, a pure black pixel is zero. In general, the average is always about 0.5, or it's really close to 0.5, even when images like a, like a field of snow, you'd expect them to be almost exactly one. You'd expect them to be full of white pixels, or a dark alleyway, you'd expect it to be almost black. So he noticed like, ah, oh, that's a bit strange, that's a bit weird, what's with that? Okay, so what Nicholas found was that the issue is actually in the noising process of stable diffusion, which sort of if we cast our minds back, remember that the way that you train stable diffusion is you take an image that's not that noisy, you pass it to a noising function to make it noisier, and then you expect the model to take that noisy image plus a prompt which describes the original image and sort of recreate the original image. So what you really end up with is a model that takes a noisy image and then denoises it. So that's really all stable diffusion models are, they're like denoises. Okay, and it turns out that there's something wrong with the noise function. So ideally you want a noise function that it takes in an image and destroys most of the information in that image. And then the latent diffusion model has to do a lot of work, you know, and become really clever to be able to take the noisy destroyed version and, and make the, the good version again. And the issue it turns out is that the noise function everyone's been using destroys some information way faster than other bits of information. And you can actually kind of see this just by looking at what's on the screen right now. So in the original image, you can see that there's a book with writing on it. And in the noised image, you definitely can't see the writing, but you can still basically make out the book. And this is basically where the issue that Nicholas found. He found that very small details um, tend to get destroyed really quickly and really large details don't get destroyed. And that way the latent diffusion model gets very good at recreating small details, but it doesn't get so good at recreating large details because it can rely on what's already there. So the way that the denoising function works is it takes a single pixel from the input image and along with that pixel, it takes uh, a value from a normal distribution. And a normal distribution, you don't need to worry about it too much, basically, what it takes is a small number that's close to zero. So you take this random number that you've just sampled and you multiply it against beta, which is like just a very small number again. So you, you take the small number near zero, you make it even smaller, you end up with a very small number. And then all you do is you just add that very small number to the pixel you brought in to get a very slightly different pixel. And then you shove the pixel straight back into the image where it was. And you do this for every pixel, and once you do that for every pixel once, that's one noising step. And you do that like, you know, 120 times or a thousand times or however many noising steps that you need. When people talk about the noising function in papers or you read about the code in code repositories, you'll find that they have a very condensed way of speaking about it. Um, but this is actually what's going on under the hood. You grab a pixel, you add a tiny bit of random noise to it, and then you plonk it at the other side. And you just keep doing that for every pixel, and then you keep doing that multiple times for every step. That's how noising works. And what Nicholas found out is that noise has a much bigger impact on so-called high frequency features than it does on low frequency features. So what you're looking at here is a very cool demonstration by the company Nicholas works for, um, where they've taken a single image and they've decomposed it into different images 
with different frequencies of features and images. So if you added all these images on top of each other, right, you'd get back to this original image. So the first image contains very low frequency features, and then the second one contains slightly higher frequency features, and so on, until you have very high frequency features over here. So you think very low detail features, very high detail features. When we apply noise to the image, you'll see very quickly that the high frequency features turn into noise instantly. Already, at this stage, basically, this image is meaningless. It doesn't contain any more meaning. But the low frequency features, which you can see here, are kind of untouched. And this trend proceeds. You know, the second highest frequency features now are also coming kind of meaningless, and we're kind of losing the middle frequency features. But the low frequency features, basically, they haven't changed much. Now, if you want to get a bit more technical and mathsy, um, talking about frequency inside uh, an image relies on this idea of a way that you could create an image where instead of using pixels, you use sine waves. So you've got like a sine wave, you know, zeros down here, ones up there, and then, you know, as time proceeds, you start at like 0.5, and then you go down, 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 down to zero, and then you go up, up, up to one, and then you've got a sine wave. Uh, and you can think about how you could turn that into some pixels by being like, okay, well, you know, this is 0.5, so this pixel is sort of light, but not white. And then this is zero, so this pixel is black. And then this, this is one, so this pixel is up the top. Um, so you can turn a sine wave into a row of pixels. And then if you want, you can just go ahead and extend that row down, you know, and make as many pixels as you want. And you can kind of turn that into like a full image, if you like. And so that's how you can sort of make an image out of uh, a sine wave. It turns out that what you can do is just starting from these humble beginnings of a single sine wave, you can slowly, slowly create an image by adding these sine wave images on top of each other cumulatively until you actually get like a, a proper looking image. Um, but obviously this takes a long time. So when Nicholas Gutenberg tells us about low frequency features, he's referring to features that come from sine waves that have a low frequency, i.e. there's not many of them, they're big and they, they sort of take a long time to go up and down. Um, so like this is a pretty low frequency feature right here. Um, whereas like this, this is like a super high frequency feature because the sine waves are really fast, they're really quick, they're really small. So that's technically speaking what low frequency means as an image. It means that this is a feature that comes from a sine wave that's really slow as opposed to really, really fast. Uh, but you can kind of ignore that, you know, that's just like, if you want to delve into it, you can go into it. The point is, you've got some features which are big and chonky, and noise doesn't affect them that much. And you've got some features which are little and tiny, like little textures and stuff in the image. And those get wiped out by noise immediately. And as a consequence, stable diffusion models get very good at learning how to make textures, and not so good at learning how to make big things like huge shapes of colour. This, by the way, is probably why seeds seem to have such a big impact on stable diffusion. Because the low frequency features of an image are never destroyed, or they're destroyed very late in the process, stable diffusion comes to expect all the compositional stuff, the low frequency stuff, to already be determined in whatever image you give it. So when you give it a particular random seed, it'll look at that seed, and it'll sort of hallucinate some compositional elements into that seed. And once it's done that, it won't change them throughout the diffusion process. Because again, it's, it's used to being able to rely on those compositional elements staying the same. And here Nicholas does something really cool. Because we've noticed this issue, and there's a tendency to just try a whole bunch of things and go crazy. Um, Nicholas limits himself, and he says, okay, I'm just going to see if I can fix this issue with regards to the lowest frequency feature. Um, and the lowest frequency feature of the image, uh, both in a technical mathematical sense, talking about sine waves, and in sort of an intuitive like sense of the biggest feature, the one that's the most constant over the image, is the average of the image. I.e. you just look at all the pixels in the image, add them all up, and then divide by the number of pixels, and you get the average, the average pixel value in the image. And Nicholas went ahead and he determined that, yeah, you know, the average isn't really affected by this noising strategy at all. And just to sort of wrap my head around everything, I also went ahead and did an experiment where I rewrote the stable diffusion noising functions 
and then I passed in an image and then I noised it 64 times and then I took the mean each time and then graphed it. And you can kind of see that like the mean doesn't change much between each noising step. It, it changes at this pretty constant rate and it stays kind of close to where it was originally. So uh, that's sort of the issue that Nicholas was pointing to. He was saying like the noising function, it doesn't really affect the mean. So what happens as a consequence during training is you'll take your image, you'll noise it, and the noised image will have basically the same mean as the denoised image. And over time, stable diffusion would like catch on to this. It'd be like, ah, okay, they've just given me an image. And every time I output an image that has a different mean or like a wildly different mean, they punish me. So I'm going to make sure whatever I output, whatever I output, it has to have the same mean or they're going to get angry with me. So it learns to do that and to preserve the mean, which you don't necessarily want, which means that in the long run, when you pass in an image that is literally just random noise and nothing else, it goes, okay, they want the image that I pass out to have the same mean as this random noise, which random noise, if it's like big enough, will always have a mean around 0.5. And then out comes your 0.5 mean output image. This is why dark alleys and snow and stuff all end up being around 0.5. Um, and both Nicholas and a lot of other model trainers that I've talked to have pointed out that this can be really harmful because it prevents the model from exploring sort of like high contrast images. It takes a whole area of latent space, i.e. the area which has like wacky averages, and tells the model like, no. Okay, so what's the solution to this? Um, in terms of code, the solution is like really easy. And in terms of logic, the solution is also really easy. So. You remember we had that noise function before where we take each pixel, we take a random sample and then we multiply them together and then plonk the result back. Well, the only difference we make is that after that's done and every pixel has been put back into the original image, um, we just take one more sample and then we add that sample to every single pixel in the image. So each time you do a noising step, you also randomly sample a value and then add it onto the whole image. And obviously this is going to have an impact on the average of the image because the average is being altered by a set amount each time. Adding this into like stable diffusion code is really, really easy. All you do is generate one random number per channel. So like for a normal image, you've got three channels. So you generate three random numbers, multiply that by 0.1 and then multiply your, your usual noise by that. So it's like very, very easy to implement. Um, and the results are like pretty good. So our boy Nicholas altered the noising strategy and then trained on this special noise on 40 images for a thousand steps. And immediately you get these images that are a lot more dark or light. And you can kind of see that this image here of the town looks sort of a lot nicer than the original one up here. Yeah, and that's also what I found as well. I plotted the means from the old strategy over 64 steps along with the means from the new strategy and you can see the new strategy, the mean jumps around like crazy. And the idea is that with this new strategy, your latent diffusion model will have a lot more freedom in choosing what kind of means, what kind of image brightnesses it wants to generate. And this seems to actually have like quite a big impact on the quality of the model. Remember that Nicholas just fine tuned on 40 images for a thousand steps. And already the sort of the contrast and the sort of luminance and the lighting that we're getting in the second images is a lot better than what we were getting originally. Like aesthetically, these ones look a lot nicer. And in fact, they almost look a little bit mid-journey-esque to me. I'm imagining that the mid-journey engineers probably stumbled upon this noising issue a long time ago and they created a fix. And that's why mid-journey has been so far ahead of everyone for like the last four or five months. Okay, so that's offset noise. Very cool, very impressive the difference in quality that Nicholas was able to get after just training for a thousand steps. That's kind of crazy. And also, of course, all he messed with was the average. There are probably a lot of other low frequency features that are not being noised properly at the moment. And if we started noising them correctly as well, maybe by taking like large sections and applying sort of blobs of noise or something, I don't know, um, we could improve the models even more. So could be some very cool papers coming out in the next month or two, but We'll put all that aside. Let's just look at some images. I told you at the beginning that one of these was the Illuminate model, which was trained by a community member, 
Whereas the other one was the mid-journey model, which I had to pay for and was trained by a team of geniuses making millions of dollars a year. Um, and if you can't tell which is which, then that's crazy. And it turns out that these on the left here, these are the ones from the Illuminate model. And in my opinion, at least these three, uh, they look a bit better to me. <laughs> I'm kind of more keen on these ones. I did a bit of a longer comparison. Um, in the middle is Illuminate V1.1. This is the new model that was trained with offset noise. Um, on the left is Illuminate 1.0, which was a model trained by the same guy. And I think it's quite similar, except this one was trained without offset noise. So by comparing the two, you should get some kind of an idea of how much better offset noise can make your images. That said, it's, there's a chance that I wasn't using like the optimal settings for Luminate 1.0. So, you know, take this with a bit of a grain of salt. But I think you can see that the images in the middle are a lot more dynamic. They have a lot more depth. Um, and you have Midjourney, of course, on the right. Uh, the biggest thing that Midjourney has over the other two is that it really matches the prompts a lot better. Uh, and that should kind of be expected because the text encoder that Midjourney uses is a lot better than the text encoder that Stable Diffusion uses. But the image quality, I think, is very comparable. Okay, that's it. I'm done. I just want to say very much huge thanks to Kako. Go check out his Discord. And, like, I am so impressed that the open source community, just for free, just in their free time for lols, has managed to catch up to Midjourney, which is like a team of millionaires. So, that's really cool. That's heckin' sick.